So, looking at political Islam and international relations, or Islam and international relations, is really a question of a clash of civilizations. Um, and you'll, you'll be familiar with that sort of term from Bernard Lewis and, and then Samuel Huntington. Um, in a sort of slightly more nuanced or constructivist way, um, there's this sort of approach that would, that would consider Islamism or Islam to be a repertoire or a discourse or a language of politics. So this is a, in some ways a sort of compromise between the first two approaches, which is to say it's not all about religion, but it's not, but religion is not completely irrelevant either. Um, and uh, interests are shaped by people's worldviews, and religion is very important to worldviews, and therefore religion somehow shapes state behavior. Um, <clears throat> so there are, there are all these sort of different ways of looking at political Islam and international relations. And the one that I've tried to advance, uh, and what I'm going to talk about today, is um, a, another, a, different one again, a different one again, which I would describe as a sort of historical sociological approach. And in this, I look at Islam and political Islam as part of, uh, as constitutive parts of domestic political power. Um, and I'll go on to sort of explain in some detail what I mean by that in the lecture. Um, and that importance that Islamism has had domestically reflects and, and impacts on uh, international relations on the regional level, so on regional order. <clears throat> um, so, before I get into the, the sort of empirical uh, material, I want to give a very quick overview of the theoretical framework that I'm working with. Um, and this is derived from the work of Gramsci, of Antonio Gramsci, um, as well as Louis Althusser. So a sort of neo-Marxist um, political theory, which I think is very useful um, in approaching this topic. And I argue that we can, we can look at the role of Islam in Middle Eastern international relations as part of the hegemonic strategies of key states in the region, so pivotal states, important states, states with, uh, with regional influence. And there are two central elements to these hegemonic strategies. And the, the first one relates to the region's subordinate status within the world, you know, from being colonized by Britain and France to being dominated by the, uh, the superpowers during the Cold War. Um, and we can call this sort of competitive rent seeking, which is competition among each other to secure external resources, um, which is, has been very important to all states of the region in, in ways that have varied over time in enabling them to consolidate power um, domestically. And closely related to this is a, is a second hegemonic strategy, which is ideological externalization. And um, this by this, I mean the use of foreign policy um, or international alignments, international relations, as in order to sort of compensate for or augment domestic political strategies that are geared towards organizing hegemony. So Gramsci's idea of hegemony, uh, has anybody come across this, this concept before? The notion of hegemony? Shall I, shall I explain very briefly what I mean by hegemony? So for, for Gramsci, the state, um, the modern state, which is an instrument of control for the ruling class, the bourgeoisie, persists and reproduces itself to the extent it's able to organize hegemony domestically. And this is um, through promoting and gaining acceptance for uh, a worldview, a particular view of the world, whereby people accept as legitimate and just the power relations that are existing within the state. So strong states have high levels of hegemony, um, weak states have low levels of hegemony, um, and ideology is extremely important in this. So Gramsci's idea was basically that you're being, you're being dominated by other people, but you don't really realize it because it's the most normal thing for you. You don't really, it's common sense was the term that he used. It's common sense, the, the, the existing framework of things. Um, and obviously this is not just about ideology, because people will not accept their, um, their condition if they are materially 
deprived, if they're wanting in basic resources, um, if they're politically oppressed. So there's a material component to hegemony as well. The two things have to go together. And to the extent that material well-being is not being addressed, ide ideology will also be, become sort of rather thin uh, and unconvincing. And that's where you get sort of um, cracks in hegemony um, and counter-hegemonic movements. So this is all Gramscian language to sort of, uh, to sort of understand how states uh, anywhere in the world kind of reproduce themselves. Um, and I think in the Middle East particularly, but this is something that applies to other parts of the world as well, this worldview, this sort of hegemonic worldview, can be, can be established through foreign policy as well as domestic policies. And particularly in the case where domestic policy is not providing essential economic, for essential economic and social needs, is not providing uh, political inclusion, um, foreign policy can compensate for that. And so in the Middle Eastern case, a lot of this has historically involved anti-imperialist foreign policies or solidarity with the Palestinian cause, um, which, are, which have been rhetorically used uh, to sort of cover up for domestic failings. And I argue that this is not simply a kind of, you know, incidental rhetorical device, but this, is, this has been integral to um, domestic power. So there's that relationship between foreign policy uh, excuse me, and domestic politics. Um, so the second main sort of conceptual um, piece of apparatus that I'm using, or concept, concept that I'm using, is, is the notion of the ideological state apparatus, um, which was advanced by Louis Althusser, who's another Marxist thinker. And it's very similar in some ways, or at least very compatible with Gramsci's idea of the organic intellectual. So another big, a big sort of um, feature, very important feature of Gramsci's thought was that this hegemonic ideology is spread through orga organic intellectuals. So this is people who are not necessarily card-carrying intellectuals that would say, I'm an intellectual, but people who deal with ideas and who reproduce the dominant ideology, the hegemonic ideology, through their everyday work, through their um, and through their writings. Uh, and so for Althusser, this ideological state apparatus also is not just official information ministries and state-run press. Uh, it's ostensibly private organizations as well. Um, and there can be diversity in that. There can be, you know, party politics and different political views. But for Althusser, all of them within hegemonic states can be considered part of the ideological state apparatus, and that in one way or another they legitimize the status quo, they legitimize the existing order of things. So I find this concept extremely useful when looking at foreign policy in the Middle East, because it enables us to look at not just the state narrowly defined and the foreign ministry narrowly defined, or the president of Egypt or Iraq narrowly defined, but enables us to look at non-state actors, and particularly Islamist actors, which have historically had very pronounced and very uh, specific views on foreign policy and international relations. And they're often discounted from studies on Middle Eastern foreign policies, um, depending on the state, obviously not in Islamic, you know, in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, you know, then they, then they matter, because the Islamists took control of the state, um, or potentially in Turkey, you know, after 2002. But in other sort of quote-unquote secular states like, uh, like Egypt, um, like Syria, political Islam is considered to be, not, not, is not generally considered to be part of the foreign policy of that state. Um, but I argue that it should be. That foreign policy, the unit of analysis in foreign policy should be an amalgam of state and non-state actors. So Islamist groups are not separate from the foreign policy process. They're very much part of it. So very broadly, sort of summarizing all of that, um, I think my, my sort of broadest points to make are that internal sociology, the internal sociology of the state, and history matter within international relations. Um, and from that, I want to ask the question, how Islam has informed, can't really read the blue bit at the bottom, sorry about that. 
Um, how has Islam informed and challenged state hegemonic strategies uh, in the Middle East? So I will proceed to give a very kind of a, a schematic, um, perhaps slightly chaotic uh, discussion of some of the ways in which this has operated over the 20th century and up until now. Um, so, kind of Bird's idea of the historical period that I'm interested in, um, and to argue in favour of the importance of history, because states are not the same, states are works in progress, states change all the time. Um, so this is a departure from, you know, sort of realist, uh, sort of uh, models of international relations, where the state is a static unit that doesn't really change. You don't have to understand how it changes to understand its um, behavior. Um, there have been, I think, four key shifts in the regional political economy since you know, the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, the modern, what, what, what we would normally consider to be the modern period in the Middle East. Uh, and Islam, the role of Islam in politics has changed over that period as well. So the first period would be the conversion of the region's economies to capitalism, um, which occurred throughout the 19th century, particularly towards the end of that century, which resulted in the rise of uh, the notable class, which is another word for kind of landowners, uh, often described as feudal, although they're not really, they're more like agrarian capitalists, but wealthy, uh, landowners who monopolized a lot of land, as well as merchants involved in trade for international markets as the region became incorporated into the world economy uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century. At this time, Islam, you could say, served as a kind of glue, sort of societal glue. You know, religion formed very much, much of the worldviews of the, the vast majority of the population. The intellectuals of the time were from the religious establishment, the, the ulama. Um, increasingly, you know, um, learning about Western ideologies like liberalism, like socialism. But essentially, if, to the extent they wanted to connect with ordinary people, with the peasantry, that would be through Islam. Through Islam as an, as an idea system, as a religion, but also the institutions of Islam. So it served very much as a kind of connecting rod between elites and the masses to the extent that such connecting rods existed, which was getting shakier and shakier over time. Um, the second major shift in the political economy of the region that's important is the, are the uh, independence revolutions um, in the 1950s, mainly, uh, which resulted in the empowerment of a new ruling class or the emergence of a, real, a new ruling class, um, which is usually referred to in the Arab world as the Effendiya, which you can, you can roughly translate as lower middle classes. So this was also a result of the, uh, the rise of capitalism in the region, um, urbanization, as peasants were sort of forced into the cities from, and from, uh, uh, from their land, the rise of education, the rise of uh, bureaucracy, um, and so there was there was the, the the rise of a new middle class, sort of between the between the end of the First World War um, through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, that became politically more and more important. And many of the political movements that emerged from this class, the Effendiya, um, drew on Islam, but they fused it with ideas about socialism, about revolution but anti-imperialism that were, you know, circulating in many parts of the colonized world at this time. And you can, you can think of this as the ideologization of Islam. So Islam is no longer a force for stability. Um, it's a force for, for rebellion and revolution. And I'll go on to talk a little bit more about how that, how that operated in the, in the Arab world, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. The third phase it, we can trace to the, to the 1970s, the beginning of the 1970s, which is the rise of neoliberalism and post-populism. Um, the populist period being that of the, of the 50s and 60s, failing 
um, for various reasons by the end of the 1960s to produce economic uh, prosperity for, for many people and also failing to ensure the security and stability and hegemony of the regimes, the populist regimes. And the, the 1967 war in which the, the Arab armies were defeated by Israel in six days was, was sort of critical to puncturing that, that sort of hegemonic narrative that I'll come on to talk about. But essentially during this third phase, um, you had the, the re-empowerment, you could say, of the, the private sector. So, so during the 50s and 60s, the period of the independence revolutions, the most, um, most of these states were nationalizing industry, were nationalizing business, private sector was, was very weak, and mo most of the economy was subordinated to the state. The 1970s started re to reverse this process. Um, and this witnessed a resurgence of political Islam, um, and also the emergence of this, another phenomenon which you can call post-Islamism. So Islam, political Islam was, was very central to the um, rise of neoliberalism uh, in the Middle East from the 70s. The fourth period is not really a real period because we're, we're sort of still in the, the neoliberal era, but there have been certain shifts, I think, since the Arab uprisings. Um, again, I think particularly in Egypt, but I think you can probably see this happening elsewhere as well, which is that the state is again sort of trying to dominate economic and political life um, you can call this sort of neo-populism, um, and I think this is a, this is a genuine question that uh, that intrigues me is whether this this represents the failure of post-Islamism, and I'll I'll talk a little bit um, about what I mean by post-Islamism. So here, I'll probably not. How long have we been talking? Hmm. Twenty minutes or so. So this is basically the. Uh, the order that I will continue to talk about. And this corresponds roughly to chapters in the, in the book that I've been writing. So I won't be reading out every single chapter, but I'll try my best to summarize um, what I've been trying to talk about. And much of this will just be expanding a bit more on what I've, what I've already said. So, I opened by talking about this, the art, the, um, this period when the Middle Eastern economies started to embrace capitalism um, and identified the notables, this is the landowners and merchants, as the ruling class of the period. And you can, you can sort of look at this, this phase, particularly from the end of the First World War, as being a sort of formative period of the Middle East international system. So, so many of the kinds of dynamics that persist to today, till today in, in various forms, you can see emerging at this point. So this sort of land, landowning, absentee landowning merchant ruling class came to power, with quotation marks, in a range of countries. 1919 in Egypt, the Egyptian revolution of 1919, the year later in Iraq, and then slightly later in Syria and Iran. This is not to say that these uh, sort of very arist aristocratic politicians had, f were, had full power. The um, colonial power of the time, the main power, power broker of the time was, was Britain, uh, and, and, monar and monarchies were in place in Egypt, Iraq, and Iran. But they had considerable leeway over relations with each other and did engage in political rivalries with each other and tried to achieve dominance um, in relation to each other. So as I said before, the, the, many of these politicians were deeply influenced by liberal ideologies, by liberal ideas, um, as well as uh, notions of Islamic reformism, which were which was an intellectual movement that tried to show that liberal values could be compatible with Islam. It was a way of, of sort of showing that Islam was, was, uh, was, was fit for the modern age. Um, 
So these, these um, administrations, these notable administrations, were in rivalry with each other, but they were also all, to varying degrees, threatened by new rising political movements of the FND, or the middle class, the new middle classes that I talked about earlier. And there was different sort of ideological repertoires uh, used by these movements. Some drew more on religion than others. There were communists, there were socialists, there were fascists, um, and there were Islamists. But they often, in one way or another, were demanding more thorough independence from Britain. Economic sovereignty, particularly in the case of Iran, was a, was a very important theme. Um, deepening of political inclusion. At the time, politics was something that involved a very narrow minority of society, a very narrow elite. Um, and various concepts of social justice. So a lot of the foreign policy thinking that came out around this time was responding to these two uh, dynamics. The first, the competition between elites in different states. And the second, the threat that they felt from revolutionary movements in their own societies. I think it's useful to be a bit more specific about what I mean by competition. So it's, it's, it's quite common in international relations to talk about struggles for power, struggles for influence, struggles for domination. In the Middle East at this time, these struggles were not just for their own sake. This wasn't just for, for, for sort of um, self-aggrandizement or a lust, a lust for, for influence. Um, these were considered existential uh, struggles. The position of these um, governing elites depended overwhelmingly on British support, on external support. It was British arms that kept them in power, that prevented their overthrow from other, from societal movements. And one of the ways that you could ensure that Britain would continue to support you, and this was very much the case between Egypt, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, was to show that you could influence the whole region. You could police the region in the interests of Britain. So not only, you could, not, you're not only asking for support for your own sake, but because without, you know, without Egypt, without Iraq, without Jordan, the Arab, the Arab world as a whole would, would succumb to revolution and anti-imperialism. So that's what these struggles of domination were about during this period. They, of course, weren't expressed in those terms. That's not what the politicians of the day would say to people. They were rather couched in a repertoire that people could relate to, and that was Arab nationalism. And this is a different kind of Arab nationalism to the, the variety that's associated with Nasser of Egypt, who we'll talk about um, in the next bit. So Arab nationalism was heavily inflected with Islam. The Muslim Brotherhood, um, which, which was formed in Egypt in 1928, engaged with Arab, Arab nationalist concepts and linked them to Islam. Even secular Arab nationalist thinkers stressed the importance of Islamic heritage as a form of solidarity amongst Muslims. So the politicians, the notable leaders of the day, were able to use Arab nationalism both to uh, sort of appropriate the discourse of revolutionary movements and neutralize some of the threat from below, but also to demonstrate that they had regional, a regional influence. And Palestine became the key focus for this. So the purpose of Arab nationalism was to protect Palestine. But it was, a, it was a conservative Arab nationalism. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it did not entail um, overthrowing monarchies. It didn't entail ejecting Britain from the region altogether. It certainly involved seeking more autonomy from Britain. Um, but these regimes were not, were not looking to, this, this was not like Iran you know, in 1979. They were not looking to, to kick Britain out altogether because they knew that would mean the end of their uh, domestic. Hegemony. 
Um, so I think the interesting thing about this is that often Arab nationalism, the Arab world is considered to be the center of the Middle East, or the core of the Middle East. Turkey, Iran, Israel are, are, are deemed to be peripheral. What's that? I have musical accompaniment. Where was I? Um, yeah. Turkey and Israel are deemed to be sort of peripheral to the region. We talk about, I mean, a lot of IR uh, scholars talk about the Arab core uh, and then the, the northern tier of sort of Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan's sort of division, which we still sort of think of, and, and it's reflected in academia as well. You have Arab studies centers and Middle Eastern studies centers that are not necessarily um, kind of, you know, looking at the same thing. And that's, there's often an implicit assumption that this is because of Arabic as a language, because of cultural uh, continuities, um, which the Arab world has that the other states of the region don't. But I think another sort of over, often overlooked reason is that um, this order became Arab rather than Islamic because the Arab states had to compete for British favor. They had to compete with each other for British favor. And they did this through a repertoire of Arab nationalism, which was a language to justify regional influence, whether that be from Egypt uh, or from Jordan, um, where it was often expressed in terms of the d dynasty, the Hashemite dynasty's legitimate right to be in charge of all Arabs. In this, and similarly in Iraq, um, similar sort of um, discourse of Arab nationalism centered on Baghdad, or Arab nationalism centered in Amman. But I think it's useful to, look, to, 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 to notice that there's, there's a reason that Turkey didn't engage in this kind of discourse. I mean, on the face of it, there's no reason why it shouldn't have. You know, Turkey was the center of the Ottoman Empire, the Caliphate, you know, it was, it was um, used the Arabic script until Ataturk came along. Uh, so there's no sort of intrinsic reason why Turkey or Iran shouldn't be part of this supranational regionalist project. So I think the reason relates to this need to compete for external favor, which Turkey didn't have to do because Turkey was bordering the Soviet Union. Um, it, was it was right next door to Europe. Turkey could be assured of Western support no matter what. It didn't have to demonstrate regional influence particularly to get Western support, particularly as the Cold War um, started to heat up. So I think that's one important reason. Another important reason is Turkey was a more hegemonic, it was a more established hegemonic system. There was a state bourgeoisie, a system satisfied middle class. So this wasn't just a narrow regime clinging onto power, being supported by foreign uh, backers. This was a state that was based within a professional and bureaucratic middle class that supported its pro-Western orientation. So I think these are very important issues to look at, particularly when we assume that sort of Islam or Arabness are intrinsically, you know, primordial, primordially uh, significant in the region. So the, the little concluding, uh, I've put all my conclusions in blue, which you can't read, which is really, really helpful. Can you read that blue? Can anybody read that blue text there? Not really. Well, it basically says what I've just said, which is Islam and Arab unity, they served as a connection between notables and the FNDA movements that were challenging them. But this also didn't imply revolution. You know, this was a conservative uh, form of, of um, Arab nationalism. And Islam during this phase played a conservative role. It functioned in a conservative way. Okay. So the next, the next period, so this is following the uh, anti-imperialist, anti-colonial independence revolutions, particularly the Egyptian revolution of 1952. We can ca characterize this phase in Middle Eastern order as one of Arab neutralism. So this was basically a doctrine that stated that uh, 
the Arab states as a whole should not tilt either towards the United States or the Soviet Union. They should remain neutral. Um, the 1948 Palestine War um, was quite important in discrediting the uh, ideological strategies of the notable regimes. So they were basically saying, we're all together in solidarity to defend Palestine. Uh, don't overthrow us because we really care about Palestine and you really care about Palestine. And actually we're going to invade now that Israel's declared itself just to prove how much we care about Palestine. And then they were all defeated and the militaries of these countries were revealed to be weak and riddled with corruption. So this defeat in 1948 uh, was very significant, sort of, you know, underlying cause of the Egyptian and other revolutions, and also in Syria, there was a military takeover, and later, in 1958, in Iraq, uh, military takeover. All of these military movements, all of these military coups, were led by individuals who came from this FND uh, class, so they were part of the same sort of political revolutionary ferment that was challenging the existing order in the 1940s, uh, 1930s, 1940s. So that defeat in 1948 very much discredited this notion of sort of ideological externalization, this using foreign policy to bolster domestic hegemony, which Palestine served as uh, in an earlier period. The defeat in 1948 sort of exploded the myth of that strategy. So the kind of archetypal revolutionary regime and the, you know, arguably the most important state in the Middle East from the middle of the 1950s until the end of the 1960s was Egypt. But the social kind of profile, the character of the regimes in Syria under the Ba'ath uh, and in Iraq uh, were very similar. They were also rooted in this FNDA class. But it's very useful to look at what the FNDA are. The FNDA are lower middle class, professionals, students, um, academics, journalists. They have some money, they have some stability, they have some status, but they want more. That's the basic kind of crude generalization about the FNDA class. They were not communists, not all of them, some of them were. They didn't necessarily want all of the poor peasants that, that were uh, poorer than them to, to rise up to their standing. So that sort of, that kind of social um, class is very, is very supportive of the idea of neutralism, as I'll go on to say. So the hegemonic strategies of the FNDA movements also sought to keep the um, rural hierarchies in place. They weren't trying to disrupt all of the rural hierarchies. And as I said, that glue between elites and peasantry was very tinged, very much tinged with Islam. And this goes some way to explain the character of Arab nationalism under Nasser and under the Ba'ath in Syria and in Iraq. Um, these regimes also still needed external support, despite overthrowing their Western-backed governments. They could not afford to go it alone. Again, some people would argue that's because they were unwilling to take the risk of fomenting a sort of, you know, thoroughgoing peasant revolution of, of the Chinese, uh, on the Chinese model. So they still needed external capital. Um, so they needed relations with at least, at least the, the Soviet Union or the United States, which ended up being relations with both. And Islam during this period, I would say, played a very important role in sort of militating against full alignment with the Soviet Union, or justifying not becoming fully aligned with the Soviet Union. And at the same time, helping to suppress uh, local communist movements that were pushing for a full alignment with the Soviet Union. So Islam was, was something that was resonant um, within society as a whole. It was very much part of Nasser's Arab nationalist discourse, even though it's usually 
assumed not to be. Nasser is normally considered to be a purely secular leader, and that's not strictly true. Many of Nasser's ideas had been foreshadowed by the Muslim Brotherhood, which was basically the argument that socialism is already in Islam. It's not contradicting Islam, it's not something different, it's not something that um, is unacceptable in Islamic um, society. So that repertoire was substantially derived from the Muslim Brotherhood discourse. And it, it, yeah, and I think it, I think it very I think if you if you wanted to sort of characterize the role of Islam in state hegemonic strategies during the 50s and 60s, it was as a sort of anti-communist repertoire and a conservative uh, repertoire. <coughs> So the other thing I look at um, during this period is how Egyptian regional influence was, um, was extended. So again, as, as, as with the previous um, phase, the order of notables, um, the states of the region sought regional influence. They sought dominance um, of some sort in the, re in the region. And Egypt was the most successful at this, and Egypt was also very widely accepted to have the right to regional influence. And one of the most um, sort of vocal champions of Nasserism uh, was, the, was the Ba'ath Party, which came to power, um, as I'm sure you know, in Syria and, and Iraq. So the Ba'ath, from, from very early on, called on Egypt to lead the Arab world to independence. And Nasser, um, who came to power as a very charismatic leader, it was also the time when um, radio was becoming very widespread, and he, his regional prestige was immense in the Arab world. He had massive charismatic appeal. And so the Ba'ath Party and other smaller vanguardist parties of the middle class would associate themselves with Nasser to get some sort of vicarious benefit from Nasser's stature. And this imbued them with a considerable amount, a considerable amount of domestic power of their own. Um, and I think one of the reasons Nasser was keen to support these parties, which had a limited popular appeal, I think it's very important to remember, the Ba'ath in its early days had very little popular support. This was, these were sort of avant-garde intellectuals, and you know, they, they couldn't really win, win elections on their own without aligning with more, either more mass-based parties, such as the socialists in Syria or the communists in Iraq, or with the politicians of the old regime, so people who had uh, followings and clientelist networks that they could mobilize to, to win votes. These, these parties like the Ba'ath could not win elections on their own. Nasser, I think, was interested in cultivating them because that meant he could control their foreign policies. And that they, like, like him, like, like his Egypt, would tend towards neutralism, would tend towards foreign policy neutralism. And it's worth saying that the, the Ba'ath Party, you know, a, a very much a secular party, um, also certainly did not contradict Islam. It, it celebrated Islam as part of, of Arabism, as central to Arabism. So you, this this period is is um, was sort of uh, there was a very influential book by Malcolm Kerr called The Arab Cold War, um, written at the end of the 1960s, which characterised the, the sort of interactions between the different Arab states as one of between sort of conservatives and radicals, and there were all these rivalries within the radical camp, you know, between Egypt and Iraq. In many ways, these are competing rent-seeking strategies. You know, Egypt would uh, compete with Iraq for Soviet support. Egypt would compete with Saudi Arabia for American support. The Americans were also supporting uh, Nasser. And I think Islam sort of fed into both of these uh, kinds of 
rivalries. So you can hear if you go onto the, if you go onto YouTube, you can find speeches of where Nasser talks about Islam, and he talks about how Islam is a, a religion that's imbued with social justice, that doesn't tolerate corruption, that doesn't tolerate you know monopolies of wealth, and here he's directing his criticisms towards. The, the monarchies, you know, towards Saudi Arabia, towards Jordan. So Islam was very much part of that. At the same time, when Nasser was um, engaged in rivalry with uh, Iraq after its revolution, he would accuse Qasim, who was the president in Iraq, of being of being an atheist communist, you know, being an unbeliever. So. Islam could, could feed into both of these, you know, could feed, he could, it could be part of a radical discourse and it could be part of a conservative discourse. And that in turn related to Egypt's desire to, to, to take a middle road um, between the two uh, sides of the Cold War. Okay. Does anyone have any questions at this point? I realize I've been going on for a wee while. Any questions about what I've covered so far? Yeah. What, what was the competition between the Muslim Brotherhood and the Nasser at this time? If he used also the Islam and the Muslim Brotherhood also used Islam for their own ideology. What is the difference when they, they are using refer, referring to the Islam? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it depended who he was who he was talking to. Um, I think there's, there's, a, there's a book actually that's just come out by Fawaz Jurgis that looks at Nasser and Sayyid Qutb. Um, and there's, there, there are basically two sides of the same coin. Um, I think Nasser was trying to appeal to the parts of the Egyptian population that had previously followed the Muslim Brotherhood, you know, the masses of the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, but he, but he criticized and ridiculed them for being backward, for being, uh, you know, overly rigid in their religious views. Um, which in many ways might have been a caricature uh, of the sorts of ideas that many of the, of the Muslim Brotherhoods were actually, were actually putting forward. Because, don't forget, the Brotherhood in the beginning, in the first two years after the Egyptian Revolution, was calling for democracy in Egypt. Some very, very close parallels between what happened and between 1952 and 1954, and what happened between 2011 and 2013 in Egypt. Um, any other questions? Okay. So, we're getting slightly closer to recent history now. Um, so the June 67 war, which was a six, six days, this war lasted six days, sort of terminated Arab neutralism as a, as a hegemonic strategy. So this idea that Egypt was going to protect the Arab world, um, was going to draw on Soviet support and American support, and that was going to make Egypt strong, it was going to make Syria strong, which was doing the same thing, it was going to make Iraq strong. This strategy was, you know, ideologically uh, revealed to be unsound when in six days the Arab armies were defeated um, in 1967. And this coincided with the, with the, the rise in, in oil uh, revenues accruing to states in the Middle East, particularly Saudi Arabia um, and also Iraq. So from that you have these two you know, complementary factors, you have a change in the regional political economy and the shattering of a hegemonic narrative through a war led to the shift between uh, from e Egypt to Saudi Arabia as the pivotal state in the region. Saudi Arabia, which I haven't really mentioned very much up till now, but they played a relatively marginal role in Middle Eastern politics up until the 1970s. There was plenty of oil. Um, the Americans were uh, backing them. But the received wisdom in much of the world, particularly in Washington, was that the days of these sorts of monarchies were numbered and that eventually all of the, re all of the states of the region would, would turn into some version of Nasserist Egypt. 
And that's one of the reasons that the United States was willing to tolerate uh, Nasserism. They thought it was better than a communist system, um, and it was kind of a historical inevitability. So the rise in oil wealth kind of changed this calculus. Saudi Arabia became a much more important state and started to more actively promote its uh, brand of quite conservative Islam. I think you've already heard about Wahhabism this? Oh, not yet. No, not yet, not yet. Okay, well, yeah. it's on your program though, isn't it? Wahhabism. Um, so that was sort of a shift that had, had, had begun early in the 1960s, but from the 1970s became much more of a feature of Saudi foreign policy and public diplomacy. Um, but sort of more important, I think, than Saudi Arabia being able to export its ideology in this way was the ways in which Saudi Arabia was able to change the political systems, political frameworks in other states, particularly Egypt and Syria, which became very, this became very important. And so the Egyptian-Saudi alliance, which continues to this day, we can trace back to this period. And it's a very structural kind of alliance. Um, so Saudi finance was critical to Egypt's um, uh, transformation from a state-run economy to one in which uh, private investment um, and the free market uh, was, was supposed to be dominant. So private investment, foreign investment was overwhelmingly from the Gulf um, and it involved labor migration from Egypt and Syria and elsewhere to Gulf states. So there was integration between the two economies for, for the oil economies and the non-oil economies in the Arab world. This resulted in or entailed a retreat of the state uh, from uh, its economic and social role. And Islamist movements, we see this in Israel, not Israel, we see this in Egypt, we see this in Syria, um, we saw this earlier in, in Iraq, a similar process happened in Iraq, but earlier, the rise of societal Islamist movements. And this serves se uh, several purposes for the regimes. On one level, they offered a different ideology to the uh, socialists and communists that were also quite active in Arab societies. A non-revolutionary ideology, one that was fully supportive of free market economics. And on another level, Islamist movements provided uh, services, so social services, which the state was no longer providing because of the economic transformations. Um, very importantly, in order for this to work, Egypt had to break its links with the Soviet Union and move towards uh, full alignment with the United States. And that was predicated on peace with, with Israel which Egypt concluded at the end of the 1970s. So I think the important point here, um, which is maybe quite counterintuitive, is that the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which is ideologically very anti-Israeli, not to say anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist certainly, was pivotal to enabling Egypt to make peace with Israel. So I think that's, I think that's a, quite a counterintuitive observation. Um, and we can understand that as part of Egypt's foreign policy. So Egypt's foreign policy was, we tend to think of this period as Anwar Sadat, the great statesman who broke the taboo and went to Jerusalem and addressed the Israeli Knesset. And that's why it was his vision and foresight that, that enabled him to move beyond Nasserism and make peace with Israel. But actually, if you look at what enabled that to happen, it was a domestic political transformation in which the Muslim Brotherhood um, played, a, played a very pivotal role. And you can see similar dynamics, but on a much lesser scale happening in, in Syria um, around the same time. Um, the strengthening of the state, but the rise of the private sector and the rise of an Islamist opposition. Syria, um, for uh, reasons that probably not, don't necessarily need to go into or explore, uh, couldn't make peace with Israel in the same way that, that Egypt could. Um, partially because the United States had no particular interest in giving Syria what it wanted in the way that it did with Egypt, because Egypt, having Egypt on the western side was so much more important to the US. 
Um, and so Syria, the Syrian regime's approach to its own Islamist movement was dramatically different to, to that of Egypt. So whereas in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood was not legalized, but it was cultivated as a partner, a de facto partner of the state, in Syria, the Brotherhood was ended up in open uh, war, warfare with the regime and was militarily crushed in 1982. So very different models of state society relations, of state Islamist relations there. Okay. So, this phase of the 1970s, where many states, most states actually, seem to be drifting towards the West, drifting towards alliance with the United States. Even Iraq through the 70s was becoming more integrated into the capitalist economy, selling its oil, moving, mending ties with the Shah, uh, and moving closer to, to the US. So the Iranian Revolution of 1979 sort of put, put an end to that process. Um, the Iranian Revolution itself, of course, occurred in the context of rapid oil-driven modernization. The ulama, um, that, or the clergy, that spearheaded and, and came to power through that revolution had been gradually um, becoming more and more important since the 50s. Um, and here we see Islam being ideologized in an explicitly revolutionary way. So if we're talking about you know, what role Islam is playing in international relations in the region, previously it played a sort of stabilizing conservative role, anti-communist role, um, one that legitimized existing social hierarchies within states. With the Iranian revolution, Islam becomes a revolutionary doctrine. Palestine emerged as central to that, partially as a way for Iran to try and reconnect with the Arab world, because Palestine was the central uh, cause in the Arab world at the time. Um, we can, you know, again, sort of look at this as an, as an example of the ideologization of Islam. Incidentally, if you want to look at sort of connections, a, a lot of the, the ideology, these sorts of ideologies that are centering on overthrowing regimes, Islam as a doctrine of revolution, came from Egyptian thinkers, like Said Qutb in particular. Um, Iran did not, was not, was not um, or did not come to, there were, there were divergent factions at the beginning of the revolution, but ultimately it was not calling for uh, neutralism in the sense, in the way that Nasser had. It was much more about, you know, a regional security system, re regional security framework with, um, without any sort of, you know, reliance on external uh, powers. Um, and and a, a sort of one of the big puzzles here is why Iran allied with Syria. So at this time, Syria was crushing its own Islamist insurrection. Uh, and the Syrian Muslim Brotherhood sent letters to Khomeini asking for support. You know, Khomeini was backing the Islamists in Iraq against Saddam Hussein. So you know, why not support us? But actually Khomeini decided to ally with Syria during this time, which ended up being you know, one of the most durable um, alliances in the region. This is despite, on the surface, very clear ideological differences. You know, Syria being a Ba'athist, uh, secular state, and then Iran, an um, Islamic Republic. But I'd argue that we can understand this through the mutual sort of dependencies of each regime, of each, sta of each state. Or in other, in other terms, you know, they had compatible hegemonic strategies. So each of them required a particular kind of foreign policy, an anti-American, anti-Israeli foreign policy, in order to sustain power domestically. Um, one of the key uh, sort of ideological um, claims of the Islamic Revolution in Iran was that it would be exported, uh, like all good revolutions. This wouldn't just be for Iranians, this would be something that could enlighten uh, the whole world. Um, 
they set up Hezbollah in Lebanon as an explicitly Khomeinist uh, organization, which during the 1980s was calling for the Light of Fakih, which is the Iranian system, to be established uh, in Lebanon. But more broadly, the revolution invigorated the Sunni um, Islamist movement as a whole. I shall move on. So the Islamic Revolution prompted a counter-revolution. Um, this came initially through the Iraqi invasion of 1980, which most Arab states backed. And that in itself was a form of, you know, ideological externalization. So Iraq, as, I've, as I alluded to, was experiencing its own uh, Islamist insurrection, which was inspired by what was happening in Iran. Um, led by the Dawah party, Shia insurrection. Waging war on Iran was a very good way of neutralizing that threat to the regime. So again, you're, sort of, you're seeing a foreign policy decision being taken that's actually rooted in domestic concerns. And the idea of unifying the country behind the regime. Egypt, which had been um, ostracized, at least, at least uh, superficially, from the Arab fold after making peace with Israel, was able to rejoin it as most of the other Arab states backed Iraq against Iran. And this was quite important in legitimizing and providing a sort of cover for the uh, alignment that Egypt and the Gulf states had with uh, the United States uh, and through that with, with Israel was that it was more important to confront this new threat to the Arab world coming from Iran. And, and, and political discourse was not in the beginning particularly sectarian but it became more and more sectarian about defending the Arab world against a revolution that was that could not be regarded as legitimate because it was Shia or could not be regarded as legitimate because it was Persian. So. Um, political discourse and the Islam as a repertoire became more and progressively more sectarian as time went on. The uh, Iranian Revolution caused a little bit of a problem um, in the relations between the Egyptian regime and the Muslim Brotherhood, which, as I said, had been quite uh, sort of mutually beneficial since the beginning of the 1970s. The Brotherhood was quite supportive uh, and excited about the, the Islamic Revolution in Iran, um, which was a, obviously a, quite a worrying development for uh, the Egyptian regime. But one of the things that was quite almost sort of useful for the Muslim Brotherhood in a way, which is an interesting way of looking at how ideology kind of responds to what's, ha what's actually happening in the world and how political decisions have to be rationalized in ways that make sense. Um, was the occurrence in 1979 of the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. And here was an enemy that the Muslim Brotherhood could justifiably join with the regime to confront. You know, this was the communist, the Haiti communist Soviet Union intervening to prop up Marxist regime in Afghanistan and so the CIA, the Saudis, Egypt and the Islamist movement including you know what would become Al-Qaeda and jihadists and everybody was able to throw their weight behind this jihad against communism in Afghanistan. So it was very important helping to overcome the splits between state and society that were starting to emerge because of Iran. So I think the key points here, in my little uh, unreadable blue, blue blurb at the bottom of the screen, was that confronting the revolution in Iran uh, and the Soviet presence in Afghanistan furthered the internal hegemonic strategies of the pro-Western states. From this point on, you can see the Cold War in the region has more or less been decided. And some would argue that that was quite instrumental in deciding the Cold War as a whole. Um, Saudi Arabia and Egypt are more and more forming a kind of conglomerate 
rather than being in competition with each other. Their interests are so closely integrated. So this competitive behavior of trying to attract support from the outside world is, is being reduced. Okay, I've got loads of words here. Um, so we're at, we're at the 1990s now, which is another critical juncture. The Gulf War of 1990 to 91. So this is a very important shift because before that, so during the 1980s, you see uh, a kind of unity at the state level. You know, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, almost all of the other Arab states are basically... Um, oh, actually, no, no, I, 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 I've got that the wrong way around. The, pre <laughs> the previous period, you see some disunity at the state level and that you have the Iranian Revolution that is pitting uh, Middle Eastern states against each other, Iran and Syria against most other Arab states. The Gulf War, where Iraq invaded Kuwait and had to be uh, chased out by the American-led coalition, saw a high degree of unity at the state level. Syria joined the coalition with the United States, with Egypt, with the Saudis. Iran sort of was neutral, but not nearly as condemnatory as you would expect Iran to be, in which Iraq certainly did. Saddam, even after eight years of war with Iran, wanted support against the Americans and support for his uh, venture in Kuwait. So you did see in the 1990s the emergence of a kind of commonality of interests based around, and this, this title here refers to a very influential book of the 1990s called Jihad versus McWorld by Benjamin Barber, based around this idea that all of the, the, it was the end of history sort of argument, all of the, all of the states were becoming progressively more neoliberal, um, America was the, was the way of the future, the Soviet Union was gone, um, everyone should really, you know, the, 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 the age of war and, and conflict was, was coming to an end. So this, this was one of the sort of triumphalist, liberal triumphalist discourses that, that was um, occurring at the time. So a lot of states were, were keen to sort of try and uh, ride that wave, but it, it did um, result in quite a, a rupture between state and society because the intervention was very unpopular at the domestic level. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just noticing the time, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on every single part here or, I'm, or we'll, never, we'll never end, we'll never get out of the room. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the opposition to the Gulf War and how important that was for the rise of political Islam um, from the 1990s. So it sparked opposition across the Arab world, the American intervention um, against Iraq in 1990 to 91, um, but particularly in Saudi Arabia. So the issue of having American troops based in Saudi Arabia um, was one that was seized upon by Saudi opposition um, movements of various types, some quite liberal, some uh, jihadist. Um, at the same time, a lot of people were coming back to Arab countries from Afghanistan. So you had a rise, a rise in sort of Islamist opposition um, at the societal level. Uh, to the American presence. And... Yeah, I'm going to skip to this bit here. So this, at, at, at the state level during the 1990s, states like Iran and Syria were trying to um, engage with, along with the other Arab states with the United States. Syria was trying to pursue peace with Israel, hoping to get back the Golan Heights, there was the rise of the uh, reform movement within Iran, and Iran was seeking normalization of its uh, relations with um, other states. That's the kind of McWorld uh, aspect of, of regional order at the time. But you also had this sort of increase in anti-Americanism and identity politics. So a dualism of foreign policy. So even while Iran and Syria are trying to move towards the, the West, towards the US, 
they're still continuing to support rejectionist non-state actors. Um, and this is one of the ways in which non-state actors have been quite um, have been quite important. They're in some ways a sort of a sort of a, a fail-safe, you know. So for or, or they, they form a kind of leverage. So if, if states like Iran and Syria fail to get what they want from from the West, then non-state actors can can be an alternative uh, form of, of leverage. I think it's important to note that this rise of identity politics was not was not just uh, something that you could see in the Palestinian context, in the Iranian context, in the Syrian context. This was something that was uh, reflected in Western discourse as well. And it's during this time that you have the rise of this sort of neoconservative consensus, in many ways replacing the Cold War, um, where Islamism replaces communism as the sort of the, the rallying cry of, of those that are seeking Western support. The conflation of all forms of Islamism with terrorism, um, and the idea that there's an inevitable clash between Judeo-Christian world and Islam. So that sort of sense, which was being developed by neoconservative thinkers as well as the Likud in Israel, became increasingly important um, as time went on. And these are mutually reinforcing. From 2003, this process of identity politics <clears throat> very much continued, and you can see you know, the, the policies of the Bush administration in, in America mirroring in many ways the discourse uh, of the Iranian neoconservatives. So the designation of Iran as being part of the axis of evil being you know, very important in weakening the reform movement in Iran and enabling the rise of, of neoconservative forces. Uh, and the Re Revolutionary Guard Corps in particular um, in Iran. The war on terror, which was declared sort of after the uh, September 11th attacks, provided a new discourse for um, pro-Western states to seek Western support, which was basically to conflate all kinds of domestic opposition with jihadism. And you saw the continuing rise of uh, sectarianism um, during the during the 2000s as a way of sort of bringing Iran into this kind of axis of evil. So I will finish up. I'm just going to skim over these because actually I realise I've been talking for a very long time. This is the trouble when you, you give me two hour, a two-hour slot. It's like you have, I don't know when to stop. Um, but I'll try and just sort of bring things to a close by looking at a more contemporary period uh, and then some of my conclusions and then we can have, uh, have questions. So the, I think the Arab uprisings that began in 2011 were very much a part, occurred very much within the, the context that, that began after 2003. Um, the Iraq war was very important in uh, prompting Obama, President Obama, to declare that the US was going to pivot to Asia and become less embroiled in Middle Eastern conflicts and also less wedded to the support of these regimes that the United States had, in one way or another, been supporting for decades since the beginning, you know, since the end of the Second World War. All of these hegemonic strategies that I was talking about had all sort of ended in failure. You know, the socioeconomic picture was, was grim, um, impoverishment and pauperization were as bad as ever. Political inclusion was narrower than, than ever. The power was monopolized in an ever narrower clique. Um, and foreign policy, which was supposed to deliver sort of security and prosperity and stability for the United States, but also you know, make life better for the um, people of the region, particularly the Palestinians, but also others, had failed. And this, all of these failed strategies contributed to the, to the uprisings. So it was a culmination of failed hegemonic strategies. The uprisings in many ways delivered on the promise of post-Islamism, which I haven't really talked very much about. Post-Islamism 
is a kind of synthesis between political Islam and liberalism. So it's a sort of way of trying to reconcile between uh, the need to engage with the liberal world order um, and the need to be appealing to societies. So post-Islamism was a sort of way of bringing these two things together. And that was manifested in the, the way that you saw solidarity amongst protesters of different ideological trends. Um, it was also manifested in the way that the protests in Egypt were against not just the regime, but also ended up being against the Muslim Brotherhood as well, once the Brotherhood came into power. And you can also see the sort of, you know, poster child of post-Islamism, which, uh, which was at, at that time probably still Turkey, was still celebrated as an example of a state that could be um, governed by a, an Islamist party or a party with Islamist roots, but also be de democratic and liberal. And so the so-called Turkish model um, was then considered to be something worth emulating and something that uh, Islamists, um, or at least, at least some Islamists, considered to be worth um, emulating. But these uprisings, as we know, very rapidly produced counter-revolutions. So you had a regional, regional uh, sort of Arab revolutions and regional counter-revolution. And the Saudi-Egyptian relationship became very important again. So you had Saudi support for the Sisi regime, which was against the Muslim Brotherhood, um, but really against the sort of potential that you would have a post-Islamist system emerging in Egypt that would be less dependent on Saudi Arabia. So you see a continuation of this sort of idea of mutual dependencies between states. Um, again, sectarian narratives that have been gaining currency since 2003 continued to help uh, regimes neutralize their domestic opposition. And this is particularly observable in the Saudi case, um, where opposition can be can be uh, sort of discredited as being Iranian-backed or, Sh or Shia-backed or something like that. But also sectarianism, so playing more than just this domestic purpose of discrediting opposition, helping to justify to the United States that this regime needs to be supported because Iran is also the, the mortal enemy of the United States. And under Trump, this narrative has, has very much been accepted. Um, particularly the idea that there's no real difference between Iran, the Muslim Brotherhood, Islamic State, it's, they're all kind of the same, you know, so you can see a continuation of that sort of, uh, that sort of discourse. So, whilst I can still talk, I will uh, just touch on three main conclusions and then um, open it up. So, I think firstly, Islam's role in regional relations has not been consistent, it's not been constant, it's changed over time, and I've given some examples of how that has changed. So it's underpinned state hegemonic strategies in different ways. Sometimes it's had a radical revolutionary um, character, and sometimes it's been more conservative. And then finally, I think the alignments that states have concluded with non-state actors, particularly Islamist groups, um, such as in the Egyptian case with the Muslim Brotherhood, but also in the case of Iran and Hezbollah, these have been constitutive parts of state power. So I think it's worth considering these movements as part of the state, um, rather than being simply instruments of foreign policy. Uh, I shall stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.